All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington, and today I am joined by Malika Pavand, a research scientist at the Institute of Neuroinformatics at University of Zurich and ETH Zurich. Before we get into today's conversation, be sure to take a moment to head over to Apple Podcasts or your listening platform of choice. And if you enjoy the show, please leave us a five-star rating and review. Malika, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here, Sam. It's a pleasure. Uh, It's my pleasure, and I'm really looking forward to digging into our conversation. We will be talking about uh, your research, of course, and your keynote talk at Hardware Aware Efficient Training Workshop at ICML this year. Uh, But before we dig into that, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background and how you came to work in kind of this uh, intersection of neuroinformatics and machine learning. Okay, thanks a lot. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. So my background is electrical engineering. I did my PhD at uh, the University of California in Santa Barbara. And during my PhD, I was uh, basically focused on designing analog mixed signal circuits. Um, So I was basically a VLSI chip designer, and um, I was interfacing silicon technology with novel emerging memory technologies. So these memory technologies are uh, based on resistive switching. So how they work is that um, you can imagine you have a resistor that um, has a memory, and by applying an electric pulse to it, uh, you change the state of the the resistor in a non-volatile manner. But the cool thing about them is that they are very small, so they are nanoscale, and they can be integrated in a third dimension on top of the silicon technology. And as it turns out, uh, these are can can bring like significant advantage to AI accelerators and AI hardware, because as you can imagine, um, the key uh, component of of an AI hardware is memory, right? So you you need a lot of memory to store a lot of weights parameters. And you also need to read from this memory. And actually, most of the power um, in current uh, hardware for for training and and inference goes into reading the memory. So current hardware has what is called a von Neumann architecture. Uh, So all the CPUs and GPUs where the memory and the processing units are separated. So you would have to go fetch data from memory, come back to the processor, and, and do this all the time. And most of the energy actually goes into this shuttling of information between processing and, and memory units. So um, the idea is that you we need to bring this memory and the processing units closer together. And these kind of memory technologies actually solve uh, these two problems. So one is that they are small, so you can get a, a lot of memory, you can get a lot of density, memory density in a small area in the third dimension. And they also, uh, they have a physical property that they can do computation inside the memory. So if, uh, if you imagine if you have a resistor and you map the weight of your neural network as a conductance to this resistor and you apply a voltage as an input, then through Ohm's law, you get the multiplication, right? So you get V times G, which is a multiplication. And if you have a bunch of them in parallel, then through Kirchhoff's law, you sum these currents and you get a, a sum of the product of the input to the weights. So basically, you get this multiply and accumulate um, operation, or MAC, which is the, the key or the essential computation in in all all of these neural networks. So basically, they bring um, the computation closer to the substrate, right? So closer to the physics. And this, interestingly, is basically what uh, the idea of neuromorphic engineering field is. So neuromorphic engineering is a field that is trying to understand um, how computation can can rise from a, a underlying substrate by getting more inspiration from how brain does this very exact thing, right? So in the brain, you don't have a, an operating system. 
the the physics or the the brain itself is the algorithm is what is running the computation and um the institute where i currently am is one of the leading institute in this field and and then after my phd i basically moved here and my research has therefore been in the intersection of understanding neuroscience as basically an inspiration and understanding machine learning as a guiding principle that that kind of grounds this inspiration into math and something that we know would work and bringing it more to circuits and and physics to to implement more efficient ai ai systems um and uh, these kind of let's say neuromorphic technologies is what we call them um have the potential to solve some of the current problems that we are seeing in in AI. For example, that they there is an um, exponential rise in the amount of data and in the amount of power that is required to um, to to process this data, and also um, uh, basically that you know since increasingly AI is becoming part of our our daily lives, privacy is becoming an issue adaptation of these devices to every uh, to a personalized user is becoming an issue and therefore uh, we are working on uh, you know online learning uh, which is uh, the topic of of my talk at um, at ICML nice nice and your talk is called brain inspired hardware and algorithm co-design for low power online training at the edge on the edge Exactly. In thinking about the, the kind of memristor technology that you're discussing, um, what makes that brain inspired? Or, or yeah, is there some evidence that the brain has some similar type of uh, architectures? I don't know if that's the right word for it. <laughs> right, right. Structures, I guess. Yeah, so so I mean it's kind of independent, but also related. So so memory, te- it's a memristor is a memory technology. So um it's uh, in in a way it's very independent from the brain but what it is interesting about it or what it makes it similar to the brain is um is two things one is that in the brain um like i said the memory and the processor are co-located so a neuron is really sitting next to its synapses right you have a soma and then you have these dendrites and dendrites are are taking information and these two are really co-located they're not separated and these members of devices are enabling these collocation, right? By uh, by being very small and being able to basically sit, let's say, on top of of a, a silicon neuron. So so basically, if you make a silicon neuron and you make the synapses with these members of devices, they are really collocated. Another thing is that a, a members of device really kind of, I guess, in an abstraction level. Uh, works like a synapse. So, um, a, a synapse basically you can you can think of it as a really like a condu- like a conductance, right? So if if the conductance uh, or if the weight increases of a synapse, it it is as if the path resistance goes down. So so you can kind of model that like a like a resistor that has that has memory that can change, and interestingly. Um, you know, the brain uh, basically sends out information with, with what is called as action potentials or spikes, right? There are these short electrical pulses that um, the neurons receive, uh, they integrate, and then once that integration passes a certain threshold, it sends out another spike. So that's basically the information processing pipeline um, in the brain. Um, and a membership device uh, basically could act like the like the conductance or the or or exactly like the synapse. And the way that we read and write from these devices are actually also through through pulses. So in that way, they are they are very similar. Got it. Got it. And um, you mentioned online learning. How where does online learning come into the picture? Um, so online learning. Uh, come into the picture in a way that so basically this memristive device can change its state right and because it can change its state it's um, it's it's good for online learning because what we can do is that we can 
when we talk about the edge, right? So we're we're talking about being at the close to the to the sensors. So these sensors are are streaming information based on this sensory information that is that is arriving. We can adapt our system to to these input, and to adapt this system, we have to change these resistances. And this this device is capable of changing its its resistance through through pulsing in a non volatile way, and that is why it it kind of enables this online adaptation. You referred to the the device. Uh, do you have devices in? Um, have you created examples and uh, what kinds of applications um, do you like? What's the the application setting that you uh, are thinking about when you're creating these? So the devices I'm I don't create. I'm uh, actually collaborating with a with a lab in um, in France. It's called Cea Leti. So they kind of have these devices in a, um, almost as an in, in an industrial setting. So they have a CMOS uh, or, or a silicon foundry, and then between so in the CMOS foundry, you you kind of um, integrate. Uh, layers layer by layer these uh, layers that are required for for creating a transistor and then putting metal layers on top to connect it to other transistors and between the fourth and the fifth metal layer they integrate these um, membership devices so I collaborate with them um, and then we we basically build circuits and architectures based on the data that we receive from them um, the, the the third correct uh, characteristic of the device. Uh, we design circuits that can interface with these with these memory devices that can implement a brain inspired algorithm. Um, now the applications that we're targeting are um, more in the realm of let's say biomedical signal processing for for let's say personalized medicine applications for example it's it matches really well for online learning because every patient is different um you for example if you want to monitor someone's heartbeat or um muscle activity or uh brain activity or or whatever it is every um, it, it is much better to adapt that the device that you have the wearable device that you have to each patient based on exactly the the biomedical signal that the each patient has so biomedical signal processing for example for for wearable devices is is one big application um the other applications are any application scenario that that requires always on uh monitoring right so also, in industrial application, people are thinking about, for example, monitoring engines. Um, so anything that requires always-on, battery-operated um, monitoring of, um, of real-world signals. So it could also be, you know, temperature sensing, pressure sensing. Um, um, has A lot of people are working on keyword spotting, for example, you know, for um for alexa or siri or um any for smart homes right so whatever you have these devices have to be always on operating waiting for you to give them a command so that that would if you if that's uh, kind of monitoring has to continuously be on it um, has to be very um power efficient because then otherwise it's continuously draining your your battery can you talk a little bit about the challenges of adapting online learning style algorithms to this hardware right so uh, online learning is a really difficult problem actually uh, (laughs) because (laughs) because you can imagine so you don't have so you don't have like stored data it's not like you can you know so normally when you want to go and train a neural network you would just have a you know you you just download this data set and just run it through your network you don't have that like your data is just it's it's what it's called like batch size one right so it's it's just streaming as you go this for example has the problem that you don't have access to the past and you don't have access to the future so uh your your algorithm has to be able to cope with temporal locality so information has to be locally available in time so that's let's say one challenge 
And the other challenge is that, you know, for example, backpropagation, backpropagation, which is the basically workhorse of all training all neural networks, um, it requires information when you want to backpropagate this area, it requires information from all the synapses. And if you want to build that in hardware, um, you're going to blow up this entire system with wires because you would have to, to update one synapse or one weight. You would have to take information from all the other synapses and kind of bringing it to this one synapse. Right. And, kind and basically... Fully connected problem. Exactly. So basically your whole architecture kind of blows up with, with, uh, with wires. So this information has to be... Um, spatially locally available. So temporal locality, because you don't have access to the past and future, and spatial locality, because information of the update of a synapse or a weight has to be locally available to the synapse. So this is the second problem. The third problem is that also, you know, when you when you train your neural networks, you know, you have the luxury of using 32-bit floating point um, memory. Right, like on GPU, you can just use you know any variable with with anything you want. But if you want to have that on a hardware that is small, you can't just put a lot of memory there. Right, like you want to reduce the precision of your memory because your your device is tiny and has to kind of sit next to your sensor. So you you cannot have a big device, and because of that, then you have low bit precision. So your your memory or the weight basically has a lower bit, has, like I say, four bits, or it has eight bits. Therefore, your learning rate is high, right? So because every time you want to make a jump, your jump would be, um, you know, so you, let's say if you have, you, have, you have four levels, you have, you have four bits, you have 16 levels. So every time you, you make a jump, you're, you have, you're jumping one sixteenth of your entire memory range or your weight chain. So, so that, that's another difficulty, right? Uh, and another thing is that, so let's say you calculate your, your gradient and your gradient has to, whatever it is, let's say with whatever bit precision you do, you have to kind of map that into your low bit precision memory. So that also becomes, becomes another problem. And in the talk, I'm I'm kind of trying to say some of the some of the potential solutions that we have worked on to to tackle these uh, three problems that I have uh, just told you about. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, before we jump into those solutions, just to um, to clarify the the architecture that you're working with here it's fully neuromorphic it's it's not like you have this this kind of memory bank that is you're swapping out the memory bank in a con conventional uh von neumann architecture with you know these fancy memoristors you're trying to do all your computations uh in this you know in this hardware exactly so every, so basically we are um so the idea is that um, you're kind of replacing the the, the hardware with an end-to-end -end, uh, neuromorphic hardware. Um, it doesn't mean that you know it, it would completely replace the the current hardware because the current hardware, of course, is is great for offline learning. Um, so basically, you know, whatever you have in the cloud is going to is is going to be a lot more powerful than than what you have close to the sensor. So you you can basically have a you know very power efficient very low power edge device that is that is doing this always on monitoring, and when let's say it detects something that requires a more powerful processing, then it can maybe send a trigger to a more powerful machine, a computing machine that is that is in the in the cloud. Let's say. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm. Um kind of struggling to think through, I guess I'm thinking of like a bootstrapping type of problem, you know, on this hardware, like you've got this hardware, you don't have any operating system, you don't have any like higher level things or lower level things. Like how do you even start to work with it? Is it, you know, is it that you're interfacing with, you know, systems that you know how to control on the edges and, and that's um, how you, how you program it? So it's a, it's an end-to-end -end system. It's a it's a very good question. It's it is difficult and it's actually not a solved solved problem. But basically, the idea is that 
it's a it's an end to end system. So it goes from sensor to processor and to an, to actuator. So or or to something that gives you an output. Let's say, you know, I want to see. So I'm giving my input is my heart is my heartbeat. I give it to this processor, which is this neuromorphic processor, and then it kind of raises the flag and says, "Hey, you're going to have a heart attack," <laughs> or, or you know, or yeah, I detected the keyboard, or, um, or your engine is is about to blow up, <laughs> or or something like that. So basically, it kind of it's an end to end system. And so the control that you're exerting to get this thing to do what you want it to do is basically your modulating the parameters of these memories or basically this network that's on the thing and exactly so your network basically is sitting on the hardware so your your parameters of your neural network is is basically sitting at the conductance of these devices physically so you just map you have to map your your weights into to the conductance and you just give inputs and then uh yeah so your your network is basically your hardware uh, and so kind of jumping into this spatial locality challenge, how do you start to address that? Uh, right. So, so basically, um, like I said, you, you have to um, have weight updates that are, uh, that are local to the synapse. So if you write down, uh, if you write down Gradient descent, so the, the 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 derivative of the cost function with respect to the weights, you can basically write it down as the um, multiplication of three factors. So one becomes, um, let's say, the derivative of the cost function with respect to your error, uh, for, with respect to your output, the derivative of your output with respect to uh, a hidden state, which is basically directly proportional to your um to your weight and then the derivative of of that hidden state with respect to your to your to your weight and this actually basically becomes um activity of your presynaptic neuron so activity of your the neuron the previous layer times the activity of the neuron in the in the um postsynaptic neurons in, in the next layer, times an error. So basically, pre and the post are local because every synapse is sitting between a pre and a postsynaptic neuron. So that is that information is local to the synapse, times an error, which is uh, which can come globally. So basically what you do is that you you take the information that is local and then you multiply it by a, a global uh, signal that is that that um, that is coming to you, and your your calculate, and then you calculate the, you calculate the weight update by it. And what what we have done is that um, this actually was a, as a collaboration with University of California in Irvine with uh, with Emre FG and um, Mohammed Fuda. So. We realized that we can encode the error into um, into events. So basically, whenever the error is, let's say, higher than a certain threshold, we send an error event, and we say now we have to update because the error um, there's there's a, there's an error that is higher than a certain threshold. And based on the information uh, of pre and the post, then we have a local update information. To, to update the, the synapse. So that was, let's say, one way of going around this um, spatial locality. Other ways that people have tried um, is, is basically that at each layer, so, so let's say you have, um, you have a deep network. So at each layer, you um, employ these kind of local classifiers and these local classifiers at each layer are telling you what the output should be, and then based on that, then you calculate the error for that uh, for that layer, and that kind of generates the error for that layer for you in a local manner. Is one of the implications of the approaches you're describing that this kind of neuromorphic computation is happening asynchronously across the Compute layer is more like a distributed system than you're just kind of rolling an error backwards across a 
Exactly. So um, actually, one of the one of the key points is that um, we want temporal sparsity because, like I said, you don't want the system to be continuously running, right? So you want this to only run when something happens, and that something is basically an event, right? So you're encoding your signal into um, into a, a train of of events. So, um, and that is actually how, for example, uh, the retina encodes encodes information. So when I'm when I'm looking at this computer right now, it's not like my brain is taking frame by frame information. It just basically looks at what is changing, and and just encodes the the change in time. And the same way, you can use the same kind of encoding mechanism to. Um, take a signal, and then if if it's nothing is happening, then you just don't don't encode anything. You don't send any input. Your your processor is just sleeping, and then as soon as something is happening, um, d- depending on the rate of change of your input, you just you use you send this uh, pulse density coding um, scheme. And you send you send information basically asynchronously to the system, and the same thing can happen for 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 learning. So you're you're streaming data, your 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 system starts to kind of have an error, or it does have an error based on uh, whatever the the person is experiencing or or the um, device under test is experiencing. And then whenever this error is high, you say you have to learn. This is the time to learn. And then based on the local information of the pre and the postsynaptic spike, uh, postsynaptic activity, then you you do an update and you you change the the resistance of these members of devices basically on the fly. I don't think you mentioned this previously, but are is this uh, are the the use cases that you're describing are these fundamentally supervised problems where you've got some target and that's how you create your error and and kind of propagate that through or is it more of an unsupervised scenario? So we have actually worked on both. Um, so the field of it's actually interesting that you say. So you know this field of neuromorphic engineering is kind of let's say linked to the spiking neural network field right because because information is going into these chips in the form of spikes or events and then coming out of it so it's like an end-to-end uh, event-based system and spiking neural networks for a long time we have not had a good learning algorithm that can that can learn them that's something a, lo- a lot of people complain about so for a long time the field was um kind of working with Hebean plasticity. So basically um, kind of working with correlation-based learning. So uh, you change the weight just because of the correlation between the pre and the postsynaptic activity. And um, um, so basically correlation-based learning without, without any error, without any guide in if you're doing good or you're doing bad. And then the problem with, with uh, Habian learning is that it's also an, a greedy algorithm, right? So you, um, you know, if, if things are correlated, your weight starts to go high. But then um, because this weight is now high, what, uh, whenever the, an input comes, it uh, the, let's say the, the neuron that has the highest weight is always going to be the one that will have the highest activity and then its weights kind of grow more. So basically it's kind of like a positive feedback process. So you need a negative feedback to kind of keep things in check and in balance to make sure that all the neurons that you have in the system are kind of being part of the computation. And it's not like, one you 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 just one neur- greedy neuron that happened to have you know initial good initial condition that kind of just responds to everything. So you so you need kind of this negative feedback mechanism, which is um, kind of inspired also by the by some of the findings in neuroscience in terms of homeostatic plasticity. So homeostatic plasticity apparently. Is a negative uh, negative feedback loop in 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 neural networks in in the brain that tries to keep the activity of the neurons within a certain range. So it doesn't let neurons to be super, very underactive, so to be completely silent, or to be really overactive. So it's just 
always tries to bring the neuron in a certain regime of operation. So we have kind of worked on kind of bringing these two Hebeian learning and homeostatic plasticity together as like an unsupervised learning mechanism, also for, for sequence learning. So we have also done that. But okay. but it helps to have error, I must say. It's a, <laughs> it always helps to have to have a guiding uh, teacher that tells you where to go. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we talked about the spatial locality. Can you talk a little bit about how you've approached the temporal locality problem? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so basically, for for temporal locality, so you, you would you would want to um, what problem does it does it require temporal locality for for any input that requires um, uh, that that has a temporal sequence, right? So. Uh, if if you don't have any temporal, if your if your data set has no temporal information, then you don't you don't need this. But if if it does, then it, you need to keep some information. And um, um, apparently, in the brain, there uh, there is this kind of filtering mechanism, which is called the eligibility traces. So um, interestingly, you know, our our neurons and synapses. Are, are kind of um, behave or, or acting in a time scale of the, in the order of tens to hundreds of milliseconds. So they kind of keep this in from the information and integration so they, then for, for about 10 to 100 milliseconds. But our but we are behaving in the real world in the time scales of seconds or tens of seconds, right? And if we want to learn anything, then the question is, how how is this temporal gap closed? How is it that you know my my brain is processing something, then I receive like say let's say a reward or or a punishment or or some surprise some ten seconds later, but then my brain knows which synapses to go and 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 change, and so how is this temporal? What is what is closing this? So then apparently there's this um, kind of filtering mechanism called the eligibility traces, which are Keeping the um, the activity of the uh, the let's say the correlation between the pre and the postsynaptic neurons for for tens of seconds. So it's kind of you can think of it as an exponential decay filter, which um, which its um, its amplitude goes high and then decays within within tens of seconds, um, but it keeps this information basically. For, for that amount of time. And if within this like filtering time, filtering time constant, it receives a, a, a reward, then a neuromodulation, neuromodulatory signal kind of uh, reads this, let's say, eligibility trait and then changes the, uh, the, the corresponding synapses. So, um, and then, so this is kind of like a neuroscience inspiration, let's say. But then um, some, some two years ago, uh, a group in uh, in University of Graz, uh, um, uh, Guillaume Belek and and uh, co-authors, basically they realized that you can write down uh, the the backpropagation through time algorithm as a multiplication of a learning signal and an eligibility trace, and with an approximation that you um, forget about the future terms because backpropagation. Has, a, has has terms in the future, right? Because because we basically uh, feed the information to, to the activations. We keep all the activations and then we go back through time to see what activations were there and based on that, we update. But we don't, we cannot do this. So if you approximate to kind of eliminate those future terms, you can still get good ac- uh, accuracy on, on a certain task. So they've tried it also on reinforcement learning tasks. So... Um, basically, from let's say these eligibility traces, their their usefulness are kind of um, um, seen in neuroscience, and they're kind of also backed by by these experiments that the, this group did. And um, we have implemented them in hardware uh, using a, an interesting uh, solution. Because so basically, at the end, what you need to solve temporal locality is a filter. That has a long time constant, 
okay? And this is now backed by neuroscience and backed by math. <laughs> so, so throw some uh, capacitors into your exactly. resistor thing. But but capacitors are really expensive to have because they, they take a lot of space, especially if you want to keep information for a long time. You need to have a big capacitor. And if you ever want to have a big capacitor per synapse, then then your area kind of blows up. So what we found was that there's this specific type of membership devices called phase change memories. And these phase change memories, basically how they work is that they change their state from a, a amorphous state to a crystalline state. And that's basically the, the on and off state, right? So the, the, it's, the, it's an amorphous state and then you apply a, a current, the device literally melts and then it becomes crystallized and then it resistance drops. But interestingly, when these devices are in this amorphous state, they are not happy. They are they they are in a um, not they're not in a favorable glass state. So they want to um, uh, so they they start to kind of drift to a, a, a higher resistance. So and this drift actually happens within the time constant that we like. So they, this drift time constant is really in the order of tens of seconds. So then we realized that by one device that is in its amorphous state, we can implement these eligibility traces uh, very efficiently. And basically that is, let's say, our, our solution to this, uh, to in the implementation of this temporal uh, locality problem. And so the idea then is for the applications that require this kind of temporal locality you you can see kind of market difference in performance, you know, with and without kind of your implementation of the eligibility traces. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So so basically, without the eligibility trace, well, you you either need to have a lot of memory to keep information, you know, in the past. Um, if you don't have it, then you're not saving any temporal sequence. Uh, or any temporal information and if you want to uh, yeah so then if you want to have a let's say efficient implementation with lower with low area uh, consumption then d this will be a potential solution to to use kind of this drift of of a pc and phase change memory device in its amorphous state uh, and then the last challenge that you mentioned was dealing with the limited bit precision and the kind of coarse grain nature that uh, that that imposes. How do you deal with that? Yeah. So another. So these devices, these membership devices, basically, another good thing about them is that they have multiple states. So it's not like it's not just an on and off state. So they can they can have multiple resistor states. But it's not analog. I mean, the the hope or the dream is that they are analog, but they, but they're not really. So um, the reason why why it cannot be analog is because the the there's because of basically physics. So when a device does resistor switching, what happens is that there. So you have two electrodes, and then you have a, a let's say membristive layer in between okay so you have an oxide in between for example in in the case of oxide based devices that has some oxygen deficiencies and these deficiencies kind of respond to electric field so these deficiencies are uh, are charged so they're uh, and they they, re they respond to to electric field and they create a filament so basically you these kind of ions they, they create a filament from one electrode to another, and that's how the resistance kind of lowers because then you, you're kind of creating a conductive path from a conductive filament or a path from one electrode to another, and then the resistance drops. And the resistance of this device then depends on the geometry of this filament. The thicker it is, then the lower the resistance because then these two electrodes are very well connected. and um, the in, the less the diameter of this filament, the resistance is higher. So if you can kind of try to uh, control this filament growth, 
um, you know, you can you can kind of get the device to to show its good its its you know states. So you can you can kind of control the states of the device. So that's what one thing we did. So we and the the thickness of the these paths. This is also non volatile. Yes, exactly. So basically, let's say the thick and um, you you program the device with a certain let's say geometry of the filament. And I and I will say how we do that, and then it just stays that way, so it's not volatile. So the, the one way that you can control the the let's say the geometry of this filament is by how much current you push to it when you are programming the device. So when you want to change the state of the device, the more current you push, to, you push the this filament kind of grows thicker. Um, so we realized that if we uh, basically uh, map the error of our system at the error of the network to a, a current, then we can say, hey, if the error is high, that means that you the device has to change more, so its filament has to change more. And if the error is lower, then you uh, then you can have like, uh, then you can push less current because that means that the device has to change less. So this is basically what we mean by co-design because now you're really taking a algorithm level concept, which is error of a network, and you're really bringing it into a current that is changing a device filament, you know, like, so it's just kind of telling an error is really changing how the ions move in a physical system. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. But more, moreover, I guess the impression I have is that in kind of normal operation, this you would be applying the current in a programming phase up front. Um, but this error, when you're trying to, when you're using the technique that you're describing, are you up, applying the current like during the operation of the device? Because we're talking about online learning, so there's. Uh -huh, right, right. Yes, that's a good question. So this is a this is something that is not solved yet. So basically, while you're programming the device, you're missing input. So basically, let's say your your hardware kind of goes into learning mode, and for that whatever microseconds that you are because that these devices actually change their state very fast. So you just have to apply a pulse that is in the order of maximum a microsecond, but in that microsecond. Whatever input you're you're receiving is is getting tossed away. You're you're not you're not receiving it. Yeah. Yeah, I was imagining something more like a EEPROM where it was taking much longer time to program. No, no, no. The, yeah, exactly. These devices are very, very DG. The programming time, the access time, and the programming time are very low. So basically, um, you can even go to nanoseconds or hundreds of nanoseconds. Oh wow! Wow. And so you introduced this by talking about this analog versus digital, um, uh, like you wanting to get to full analog, but not really. Can you, how does that tie into this, um, the mechanism you're describing? So, so the, basically this whole computation is really analog, right? Because you are, um, so let's say just, just for doing, um, multiplication and addition is not like you have you have digital gates that are doing the multiplication and, and you have an adder that is doing the added so it's just really the um the physics of the device that is doing this for you and that's kind of that's basically analog computation so i thought you were saying that you want it you want it to be full analog but you can't get it to be full analog or it's not full analog did I? right so so the computation is analog and it's basically locally analog, but then when you want to communicate this information to other parts of the chip or to other neurons, then you go to, to events or spikes, which is then digital. And that's basically where the um, mixed signal design comes into play. So your, your computation is really locally analog, but then it's digital communication through, through spikes. Because when you want to send out information, if you want to send out analog information, that's very difficult. Because you, if, if an analog signal has to go through a path or a distance, then uh, this distance is kind of dissipating your analog signal, right? So you would have to put like drivers 
that is pushing enough current so that this uh, this analog precise analog value can stay wherever it is and that 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 requires again a lot of power a lot of space for these kind of buffers and amplifiers that you have to employ for for doing this and therefore it's it's good that if you want to communicate uh, a signal to go digital and then send out your your information in a digital way to another neuron as a voltage pulse and this that voltage pulse again goes through the member stirs, becomes a current, and then gets integrated in an analog fashion in the next neuron. So, so you go from analog to digital and back to analog. Wow, wow! Uh, so you've you've overcome these three key challenges that you mentioned uh, in the beginning. Are there other pieces that are required, or what other pieces are required to bring it all together so that you can actually do online learning? So I think that so currently um, what we're still missing is kind of scalability. So, um, so scalability both in terms of algorithms, so algorithms that can, so all of these, let's say, kind of hacks that I've mentioned to you, they work maybe for, you know, two, three layers. But if you want to kind of go deeper, then they don't work because there's a lot of approximation that is involved which, you know, if you want to go to, to larger networks, they don't, they're not going to work. So, so basically, we need scalability in terms of algorithms, and we need scalability in terms of hardware. So these kind of devices are, are still kind of maturing, although they, they have kind of emerged really exponentially fast in the past, you know, five years. But there's, um, they're still kind of emerging. There's a lot of... Um, let's say, problems in terms of noise, bit precision, devices. Basically, these devices that you have, they have a lot of variability between them, so they, they don't all work the same. Um, they, have, uh, they have also noise in time, so every time you program the device, um, it doesn't... So let's say if you set and reset the device like 100 times, um, it kind of sits on a Gaussian distribution in terms of the state it ends up in. So it kind of, it's, it's noisy, um, which actually a lot of people even try to exploit, uh, for example, for, for Bayesian computation, right? So let's say like it brings you like a, a search space in, in a way. So you, every time you set and reset it, kind of, you're kind of sampling from these uh, distributions. So I would say this is like basically scaling, I would say, is, is the main uh, problem in terms of algorithm and, and hardware. How close are we from seeing this in kind of practical use? Are we, are we there already, you know, in some ways or, um, you know, long way out? What's your take on that? So actually there's some startups um, out even from, from Institute of Neuroinformatics that are trying to take this to the market, but they're still working in the digital domain. Um, if you want to go analog, um, a lot of people are are doing in the in the in, in the world. Um, so I think it would be something I would say maybe five years plus, if we want if you want to go to the market because there is still really a research field of trying to like you know bringing all of these concepts from five different fields together while the technology is still emerging. I would say um, it, it it still has time. It requires time. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, by the time folks hear this, you will have delivered your keynote at the workshop, which I'm sure will be uh, super interesting for folks. Um, but best of luck. Thank uh, you so much. I, yeah, thanks a really lot. Cool <laughs> I'm looking forward to to the conference and and seeing and chatting about these concepts with. Uh, fears and i hope your audience likes this concept also absolutely thanks so much malika thank you sam <laughs>